of a thousand words. Every week I'm going to sit down with another one of our talented Charleston artists. I wanted to start with a specific artist today for a specific reason. When I came back from art school many years ago, there was no Charleston art market. There was no chance of staying here and making a living in art. Now we're the third destination for Charleston for people looking for art in the country. Um, this is just something that's been near and dear to my heart. And Nathan Durfee epitomizes a lot of the reasons that Charleston has opened up so much. It used to be the only pictures of Rainbow Row were acceptable or Charleston houses, stuff like that. Now we've encompassed all sorts of work and we've got our old favorites that we're going to get to during this series and many of our young vanguard. Um, I particularly wanted to start with his work because there's so many interesting things about him as a person and about his work, which is flawlessly executed. Um, let, let him tell you a little bit about himself. He can introduce himself and tell you a little, little bit about his background. Hey guys. <laughs> My name's Nathan. Uh, I've been in the Charleston art scene for about six years now and born in Vermont spent my college years at the Savannah College of Art and Design studying illustration. And one of the reasons that I ended up moving into the fine art gallery scene was that I just kept creating these narratives that looked like illustrations, but they weren't really fitting into any magazines. And so uh, I still consider myself a storyteller and a narrative painter, but now that I've gone in the fine art world, there's been I can explore a lot more in the ambiguity of narratives and in the subject matter. And I've loved being here. Uh, I was, I've been voted for the past four years as best visual artist by the Charleston City Paper. And this year I did the official poster for the Piccolo Spoleto Festival, which is a really fun project. I also just wrapped up a solo show here at Robert Lang Studios. And we had the opening night and I got to meet Joy then and it was a lot of fun. Thank you. I actually had met you a few years back when Robert Lang was around the corner on East Bay. East Bay Street, yeah. And you had had one of your first shows there. And I remember coming in, the gallery was packed to the walls mm -hmm. and there were red dots everywhere. You were surrounded by a crowd of people and I was so happy for you that I didn't even get a chance to meet you that <laughs> night. And I enjoyed just even seeing the response to your work was overwhelming. That was actually my very first solo show here at the gallery. Uh, I was represented by a gallery in West Ashley, and then a year later I transferred over here to Robert Lang Studios. And to show the, and you mentioned earlier about how the, the shift in contemporary art, uh, back then I didn't really have as big, as big of a presence, and that was sort of one of the, uh, that show was sort of turning point for me because I, I was still young, I was still developing, and still trying to figure out who I was as an artist, and uh, I was getting mixed reception, so to speak. And then that opening came in, and there was just so much love in the room that it really did sort of settle me in and say, this is where I was meant to be, this is the type of work I was meant to create. And so from then on, it's just been this building momentum. And this is, I think, if you're talking about when it was on East Bay Street, this is five years later. I Fantastic. Believe. And so I, it's been a fun, it's been a fun half decade. <laughs> well, one of the things I must jump in and say here is not only is your work whimsical and thought provoking and different, you use a lot of different styles um, mm -hmm. of, of classical art actually and of modern art, but it is so incredibly executed. When you see the paintings up close, the brush strokes, the work, is absolutely flawless. It's gorgeous. It reminds me when I first had seen um, Georgia O'Keeffe's work. Mm -hmm. I went to see her retrospective show up in Washington, D.C. And I had only seen, you know, one painting of hers and then a lot of books. Mm -hmm. But when you actually see the work up close, the brush strokes are all perfect. It's just amazing. And your work is like that. The color theory in it, the um, the, the way that you use like a modern cubism to tell your story, um, a, a distorted realism that's not really comic book, it's a lot more finessed mm -hmm. than that, um, is absolutely fascinating. How did you get to this? This, this uh, specific 
I like to call it patchwork style because it's almost like different fabrics of quilt being sewn together to make the subject. Uh, came very naturally. Uh, when I first started doing the painting, there is a uh, color contrast where you, you'll see a lot of impressionist painters, they'll throw uh, strokes of contrasting color, you know, bright purples in a haystack or greens and yellows in the blue sky, and it really adds a different depth. And as I painted more and more, those strokes of color sort of refined themselves, these nice little squares that link together. And it, it, it just felt right to me. And since then, though, I have been trying to figure out ways to combine that pixelated patchwork style into more traditional art applications. And so you can kind of see with the hair, there's a lot of glazing. And, uh, even in the background, there's a lot of layering of transparent colors and how it, and it helps that the squares jump out from one another. And in terms of the, the subject matter, and back to the doodling, uh, I can still remember in math class in fifth grade, I was just bored out of my skull. And I always used to draw and just doodle. And a lot of them were just comic book characters, things I used to make up. And, but I never really thought that it was going to turn into something, and then someone came to our high school and, and he was a concept artist for a video game company, and it just blew my mind, and I thought, wow, I can actually make a living at it, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, and portrait art seemed like a safer bet, but once I got into school and I started learning from artists like Mohamed Denawi and Kurt Vargo, some of my professors there, and they were all doing some fun, creative stuff, I realized that I could just create my own world. And so for me, I can abstract a figure and you can accentuate certain features to bring about a sensitivity. Like a lot of my places, a lot of my pieces have enlarged heads and it gives them like a childlike innocence to it. Mm -hmm. And right. like you were about to ask what my favorite color was. Right. <laughs> um, what's your favorite color? <laughs> For me, I love, there's, my, my, just like how my art styles shift, my, my favorite tubes of paint shift, and also color combinations. I, there's just something that I have with the yellow against the brown of the sunflower. Uh, my neighbor used to have a sunflower field, and we would run through it, and there's just something, I don't know if you've run through a cornfield or a sunflower field, there's just some weird heat that gets, everything gets insulated in the cornfield and you get scratched up just a little when you run through those. And I just have so many memories of just getting lost in this own little world of the sunflower fields and having that yellow and brown of a sunflower, I really love. For this show, uh, there is a tube of red paint that I had since college and it's, I know it's a really expensive tube of paint because I bought it remembering it was a really expensive tube and then I used it and I didn't, I didn't like it and I just put it in the bottom of my box and over the years the label of what type of red it was wore off. So this year I pulled out that tube of paint and I thought I'm going to paint with it. And so I used this, I, I learned how to use this specific type of red that I have no idea what it is. Oh, no. Once. Once I run out of it, I probably will never use it again. <laughs> but uh, I just know that back in college, I thought it was a beautiful red that I never quite learned. And, and that's the thing about painting is there's, there's colors that you like, but it's, it's almost like picking out an outfit where there may be a specific shirt that you love, but if you don't have the right pants or the right everything else to make it all sync up, even that favorite color looks out of place. And so what I love doing is just picking random, fun, weird colors and trying to figure out a way to have them fit. And so with this, uh, there is actually, there was no yellow in this painting. There is a green gold, which you can see here, mm -hmm. and then a red, which was my favorite red, there, and then we mixed them together and made this muted yellow. And so that's what I used for the backgrounds and everything. So there is a, with the exception of the nails, there is a deceptively limited palette in this painting. Right. I love it. Love it. And I noticed that you always go back to this T 
teal aqua color. You mm -hmm. use that often, and I love that color. Uh, Prussian blue. Mm. No, not Prussian, sorry. I used Prussian when I started, but then I heard things about how Prussian is a road color, it fades over time. And so I've shifted. So now Prussian is almost like this ex girlfriend that you <laughs> keep going back to and you know it's not good for you. <laughs> it's like the Maroon 5 song. Oh, <laughs> you hate yourself, but you like it so much, you feel guilty about it. And you keep going back, and you're like, I shouldn't be liking this song that much. But uh, I think with this show, I used Thalo Blue. And Thalo Blue with a little bit of that green gold is what made this turquoise color this time around. But uh, I wish I could go back to that Prussian blue, but I, I can't. I said no. I wrote letters to Prussian blue. It did not send them. <laughs> <laughs> when it's over, sometimes it's just okay. What's, what's important isn't the what's doing, what's, what's happening to the artwork that you're creating. The, the most important question is why you're doing it. And if you love creating art, who who cares or who can judge whether or not you should be doing it or not? Uh, if, if you want to draw giant paintings of decapitated pig heads, uh, go for it. Uh, I guess topics that I haven't really addressed in my previous work. And so there's this constant, not only wandering, but constant, I guess, trying different things and seeing how to incorporate that into what I do. So I hope that I can keep on Becoming, becoming better, but maybe not better is the right word, evolving and maturing. And, right. and I hope I, and I, and I hope I never kind of settle into one thing for too long. I want to keep on, I guess, adding ingredients into this kitchen that I'm, I'm making. The most beautiful